Will you all pray with me? Oh God, we come to you today, and as always, we are longing, aching, to hear you speak a fresh word into our lives, to hear your still speaking voice. And so I pray this morning that the words of our mouths, the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing to you. And where, if anywhere, we depart from your spirit, O God, may that quickly fall away. Amen. Well, this probably will come as no surprise on this first Sunday of our band book worship series, but I'm going to say something controversial. I know, (laughs) you're shocked. Here it is. Moses was a thug. What I mean by that is by today's standards, we would probably call Moses a thug. When we meet him today, He's out in the middle of nowhere, hiding, because he murdered an Egyptian official. We often forget that part of his story. We forget that while Moses is out finding that burning bush, the Egyptian media is no doubt showing his Hebrew-featured face on the most wanted list, calling him a criminal, a murderer, a thug. They're no doubt showing him as someone to be feared, with no nuance whatsoever, reinforcing all the stereotypes, all the prejudices and fears the Egyptians have of the Hebrew people. When teenage Star Carter, the lead character of Angie Thomas's novel, The Hate You Give, when she watches her unarmed childhood best friend shot down by a police officer right there in front of her, She assumes that if she can be brave, if she can share what she witnessed, then justice will be served. She even sits there at the crime scene, going over and over the police officer's badge number, so she'll know it when they ask her. Except when she goes to give her witness statement, the police doing the interview, they don't seem very interested in hearing much of anything about the police officer's behavior that night. Mostly they want to know about her friend Khalil and his possible gang and drug-related activity. Basically they want to know, was he a thug and therefore the police officer right to fear him and shoot him? The media does the same thing. Khalil, the victim, is the one on trial in the public eye. They humanize the officer while reducing down Khalil to nothing more than that identity, thug. While realizing her voice isn't going to be heard, Star retreats into hiding. Her voice goes largely silent. And she watches everything that's unfolding. It feels like her friend will never be seen as anything but a thug. Years ago now, I was in Ferguson, Missouri on retreat with a group of young clergy colleagues. It was about, I think about a year or so after Michael Brown was killed there by Officer Darren Wilson. And we went to that spot on the street where he had died. We prayed together in that place that had seen such violence. One of my colleagues who prayed that day, he called that spot where we were standing blood-stained holy ground. He reminded us that Jesus' death was also a death of state-sanctioned violence, that it was also a death that received no justice in an empire that also treated his people like their lives didn't matter. Well, when I returned from that trip, I preached a sermon here at Good Sam in which I echoed that connection that my friend had drawn between Michael Brown and Jesus. And afterwards, someone in worship came up to me. They were visibly upset. They said, how dare you compare Michael Brown to Jesus? Brown 
was a thug. They said it, but I imagine there were plenty others who were thinking it that day, because it's what our culture has taught us. It's taught us. We're supposed to see Jesus in everyone we meet, except for the ones we label thug and criminal, right? Just moments before he dies, Khalil shares with Star an acronym coined by the late rapper Tupac. Tupac famously said, thug life stands for the hate you give little infants, F's everybody. Later in the book, Star is having a conversation with her dad. He asks her what he thinks thug life means. Let's listen in to their conversation for a moment. I'll do my best to read it well for you. Well, Khalil said it's about what society feeds us as youth and how it comes back and bites them later, I say. I think it's about more than youth, though. I think it's about us, period. Us who, he asks. Black people, minorities, poor people, everyone at the bottom of society. The oppressed, Daddy says. Yeah, we're the ones who get the, the short end of the stick, but we're the ones they fear the most. So what's the hate they're giving little infants in today's society? Racism? You got to get a little more detailed than that. Think about Khalil and his whole situation before he died. He was a drug dealer. It hurts to say that. And possibly a gang member. Why was he a drug dealer? Why are so many people in our neighborhood drug dealers? I remember what Khalil said. He got tired of choosing between lights and food. They need money, I say, and they don't have a lot of other ways to get it. Right, lack of opportunities, Daddy says. Corporate America don't bring jobs to our communities and they sure ain't quick to hire us. Then even if you do have a high school diploma, so many of the schools in our neighborhoods don't prepare us well enough. It's easier to find some crap than it is to find good school around here. Now think about this, he says. How did the drugs even get in our neighborhood? This is a multi-billion dollar industry we're talking about, baby. That stuff is flown into our communities. But I don't know anybody with a private jet, do you? No, exactly. Drugs come here from somewhere and they're destroying our community, he says. You got folks like Brenda, Khalil's mom, who think they need them to survive. And then you got the Khalils, who think they need to sell them to survive. The Brendas can't get jobs unless they're clean and they can't pay for rehab unless they got jobs. When the Khalils get arrested for selling drugs, they either spend most of their life in prison, another billion dollar industry, or they have a hard time getting a real job and probably start selling drugs again. That's the hate they're giving us, baby. A system designed against us. That's thug life. I hear you, but Khalil didn't have to sell drugs, I say. You stopped doing it. True, but unless you're in his shoes, don't judge him. It's easier to fall into that life than it is to stay out of it, especially in a situation like his. Thug life. The hate you give little infants Fs everybody. In Moses' story, the hate given to infants, the systems designed against Moses' people, they're quite literal. The Hebrew people have been living in Egypt at this point for quite a while now, freely at first and with the blessing and the gratitude of Egypt. You might recall how Joseph became governor and saved the whole place from famine. But eventually, the Egyptians with power and privilege, they start to get worried that they might lose their power and privilege to the Hebrew people who are increasing in number and wealth and power. So they decide to enslave them. But even that can't keep the Hebrew people down. They were still prospering. And that made people like Pharaoh, the ruler of the land, that made him feel pretty threatened. So shortly before Moses' birth, Pharaoh orders the genocide 
of all the Hebrew little baby boys. As I said, the hate being given to little infants was quite literal in Moses' world. And of course, many of you know the story and how it goes from there, right? Moses' mother, after his birth, hides him away until he's old enough and then floats him down the Nile with a hope and a prayer that someone there at the palace will have mercy and spare his life. And thankfully, Pharaoh's daughter does that, not only spares his life, but adopts him into the royal family. So Moses is raised in a world of privilege with his adoptive family, while those who look like him are being oppressed just blocks away. He was the boy who had been marked for death from before the time he was born, who yet, against the odds, survived thug life, the hate being given to little infants. Now that all changes, of course, right? When as a young man, he begins to explore the kingdom and he starts to see firsthand the injustices that are being done to his people. And of course, we all know that his first attempts at allyship, they go terribly wrong, about as wrong as they can go, right? Coming up upon an Egyptian slave master mistreating a Hebrew slave, Moses gets into a fight with him, ends up killing him. And suddenly, Moses is a thug on the run. He's hiding out, keeping silent. Until this day, the day that we read about this morning, when he's out tending his father-in-law's sheep and he stumbles upon this strange phenomenon, a bush that is burning but is not being burned up. It turns out that God is there in that bush, just waiting to talk to Moses. God, it turns out, is looking for someone to help liberate the Hebrew people from the hate that the Egyptians are giving them. And God thinks Moses is just the guy for the job. What we didn't hear in our scripture reading this morning, but would have if we kept reading further, is that Moses resists. He repeatedly protests what God is asking of him. Why me? They're not going to listen to me. The Hebrew people think I'm a sellout because I was raised in the palace. The Egyptians think I'm a thug. Who's going to listen to me? Besides God, I'm a really terrible public speaker. I have horrible stage fright. Why are you asking me to do this? And you know, not just because of my my stage fright, but for lots of other reasons, I have a lot of sympathy for Moses. I wouldn't want to go back to somewhere where I was wanted for murder. Who would? I get why Moses is scared, why he doesn't think he's the right guy for the job, why he doesn't think that his voice is actually going to be able to make any sort of difference. He's up against a massive system of hate. Friends, aren't a lot of us feeling that same way these days? Aren't a lot of us feeling the same way? It's called despair. Despair happens when people think they can't change their circumstances, so they stop trying. America is experiencing an epidemic of despair right now. Numerous articles have been written about it. Many of us have given up hope that our voice or our actions are actually going to make a difference or create the changes we wish to see in the world around us. We see the hate that is being given to those with the least power and privilege among us, and we see the way that that hate is messing up everything for all of us. But we feel trapped in it, don't we? We may feel God calling us to act or to speak out, but we keep resisting that call because we don't believe it's actually going to work. Someone once said, the opposite of faith is not doubt, but despair. 
When Khalil's death receives no justice, Star's neighborhood, it erupts in protests and riots. It becomes a war zone. I imagine it probably looked a little something like Egypt when all those plagues were coming through. Martin Luther King once said that riots are the language of the unheard. During she and her father's conversation about thug life, Star's dad asks her how thug life applies to protests and riots. Here's how Star responds. She goes, uh, everybody's pissed because 115, the police officer, hasn't been charged, but also because he's not the first officer to do something like this and get away with it. It's been happening and people will keep rioting until it changes. So I guess the system's still giving hate and everyone's still getting effed. Dad laughs and gives me dap. My girl, watch your mouth. But yeah, that's about right. We won't stop getting effed till it changes. That's the key. It's got to change. A lump forms in my throat as the truth hits me hard. That's why people are speaking out, huh? Because it won't change if we don't say something. Exactly, we can't be silent. Whew. So I can't be silent. This scene in the book, <laughs> it's Star's burning bush moment. Star has been hiding out up till now, just like Moses, silently burning with this rage at the injustices she's witnessing around her, but not knowing what to do with that fire inside of her. It's been burning her up from within. She spent so much of the book feeling helpless and powerless to change the hate she sees around her. That's the challenge for most of us. How to become like that burning bush, a flame with anger at injustice without burning up. Slowly over the course of the book, Star figures out how to do this. She breaks out of her despair that is burning her from within, and she finds a way instead to use her voice to burn up that hate that others are giving. Now, she starts out small at first. She puts a few posts up on social media. The Khalil I remember, humanizing her friend. Then she does a feature interview with the media, her face obscured. Then she testifies behind closed doors to a grand jury. And finally, when the verdict comes down, and it is not just, she finds herself in the middle of a riot, jumping up on a police car during that riot and shouting from a megaphone for justice. Moses, too, eventually figures it out, how to burn without burning up. Despite his protests and his fears and his insecurities, he eventually does learn how to lean into God's power and the help of others and become that advocate that his people need. Friends, I wonder if we have figured that out. Do we know how to be a flame with anger at the hatred and the injustice in our world without letting it burn us up? Do we know how to listen for God's voice of liberating power coming from those flames? Do we know how to not let our despair and our fear and our insecurities be the loudest voices in the room? Sometimes I think we forget that the God who sends us out is not sending us on a dead-end mission. God is not sending us on a dead-end mission when God calls us to transform hate into love, oppression into liberation. The God who empowers us to transform hate into love, oppression into liberation, that God is the same God who took a thug like Moses, turned him into a liberator, 
who could part the Red Sea, bring his people safely on dry land into freedom, and swallow up Pharaoh and his army behind them. What would it look like, friends, if we let Moses and Star teach us this morning how to reclaim our faith and find our voice again? The book of Exodus was also once banned in this country. It was banned from slaves because slave slave owners worried that its liberation story might inspire them to seek their own liberation. In truth, that's why a lot of stories get banned. Because the oppressors fear that the oppressed might start believing liberation is possible if they discover that there is a bigger, truer, more powerful story than the hate they are being given. So friends, never stop telling those stories. We will always find God on the margins on the crosses and the lynching trees, in the banned books and among the thugs, because our God is a liberator of the oppressed. God is always, friends, always, working to transform the hate we give with the love that God gives. And friends, God's love is stronger than that hate. Thanks be to God.